Welcome back to a study of the gospel according to John. And we come today to chapter 6 of this great treatise on the deity of Christ. You will remember that John told us that he wrote all of these things. He wrote these precise things to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, John 20, 30, and 31. And so you have a great text here showing that Jesus is who he said, whom he said he was. He is deity in the flesh. There is 100% deity and 100% humanity. And he, the two came together, and we call him, as his, father, his stepfather Joseph did, Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins, according to Matthew 1, beginning at verse 21. But this study of John is so deep, really, and so simple, yet on the other hand, so profound. And it was written in a time when the idea of Jesus being deity was being attacked by a group of people who became known as Gnostics. And these people denied the deity of Christ. In fact, they denied that he was even good. Their idea, taken from Greek philosophy, was that the flesh itself is evil. And since the flesh is evil, and Jesus created, as we're told in John 1, 1 through 3, that he was part of the creating process of man, that he must be evil because he created something evil. Well, those folks got that idea from the Greek philosophers, not from Holy Bible. God never said such a thing. But in their minds, even the one we call the Father was evil because he too created, which would make the Holy Spirit evil in their minds because he was the one who organized the creation, Job 26, 13. And so you have here a text and everything we read is going to be about his deity and its connection to his work and his ministry, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And here in chapter 6, we find our master in a place called Galilee. He's not down in Judah. He's north of the Galilean Sea. And he went over the Sea of Galilee. He went over the top of it to the other side to Tiberias. And he had already uh, ordered his disciples to go there also. And when he got there, according to Luke 9.10, he, uh, the, he sought a deserted place. But Luke says he was seeking it to be alone. Well, he won't be alone because a huge crowd will follow him here. And the crowds imposed on his desire to be alone, but he has great compassion on them. And according to Luke 9, 11, he began to teach them. Such a huge crude crowd showed, so he decided he would teach them. Now, that's not mentioned in John's account, and we add that from Luke to understand what's going on here. He has gone north of the Sea of Galilee to Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles. The word there is signs, which he did on them that were diseased. They were looking for something from him for themselves. And we should recall as we read John chapter 6 that they were looking for a Messiah, an anointed one, a Messiah, a Christos, an anointed one, who would lead them against Rome. And they were looking for a Messiah who would be their military king. And this crowd wants something for itself. And that's why they are following Jesus literally and physically. They want something. In fact, the Greek says they kept on following him. And so it's interesting why they are there. And we should keep that in mind also as we study this text. They had been continually seeing the signs he did, and they were continually following him. And Jesus went up into a mountain after he got through 
this teaching process that Luke mentions. That mountain is called today the Golan Heights. In fact, it was called Golan in that day. And there he sat with his disciples. Now, we're going to be told that the Jewish holiday of Passover is very near. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Um, the lamb was slain at Passover. And this lamb of God, the Christ, is sitting on a mountain in Galilee on a huge height called Golan. And this multitude may have been made up of some of the pilgrims that were marching in order or in a very great procession to Jerusalem. Remember that the Jews had to go three times a year, at least the men did, to Jerusalem for their feasts of tabernacle and weeks and Passover. And now, when Jesus sees this huge crowd, and they were now coming to him, and they must have been walking up that hill, because they're coming to him, he asked Philip a question. Now, he knows why the crowd's coming, but he asked Philip a question. Why? Uh, why Philip? Well, where they are is very near Philip's hometown of Bethsaida. And it's nearby. And perhaps he asked Philip about well, how they were going to feed this crowd. Because he knew that Philip might think, well, I can go into my hometown and see how much I can get. But he, Philip's the one he asked. I don't know that that's for sure. But certainly that town's very near where Philip uh, was born, according to Mark 6, 34. Now, Mark said, by the time he asked Philip that question, he'd been teaching this crowd all day long. So he knew they were hungry. And the Jews intended that the miracle he would, did uh, would be beneficial to them. And this one really was. Sitting all day, listening to him teach, and now they're hungry. And the miracle he does now is going to be of benefit to these apostles, these disciples also, and much benefit. And Jesus is going to find out something about the crowd that he already knows so that the apostles can see why they were following him. And he's going to ask these apostles a very important question about why they follow him. So as we study chapter 6 here, we're north of the Sea of Galilee in our minds as we think about the geography. We're near the town of Tiberias. He's up on the Golan Heights. He's been teaching all day long. No money, Philip. But Jesus asked this to test him, for he knew what he was going to do, of course. This is deity in the flesh. And there's one of those statements, verse 6, that is intended to help us know this is deity asking a human what should we do about feeding this crowd? Philip answered, well, we don't have enough money. 200 penny worth is not sufficient. Maybe Philip was thinking, if that's all we've got, how am I going to go into my hometown and buy enough to feed this crowd? And it's interesting what Philip said here. Had he not been following the Lord all around and seen all the miracles he did? I wonder why he didn't say, uh, well... You know, God fed the people manna in the wilderness. Surely you can feed them like that, can't you? He didn't ask that. Uh, he could have said, you remember that Elisha told us that God fed the sons of the prophets who were hungry and they didn't have any money in order to buy food. He could have said, you're great, but his statement is physical. And Jesus finds out something about Philip and the others that is necessary for us to understand. Philip is still not thinking spiritually. He's still following Jesus, but he must still have a doubt in his mind about his deity. And his, his question reveals to us the heart of Philip is not yet attuned 
to whom it is, to whom it is he's following. He, he, he knows the real situation, and he's accurate about that. But why didn't he think about what Jesus could actually do? Philip, at this point in his following Jesus, has limited the situation and the power of Jesus to money. I think that might be a lesson for all of us. Do we limit what we can do for the Lord to money? How much money it's going to take? Philip did. Maybe we should learn something about what the Lord can do if we go ahead and trust Him and go ahead with the process and the program or whatever it is. One of his disciples, and here's Andrew. You remember that Andrew brought his brother Peter to the Lord. <laughs> Watch what he does again. We read about Andrew again, and he's already bringing somebody else to the Lord, a little boy, a lad, the Bible says. There's a lad, a little boy, in the original language. He's got five barley loaves. Why did the Holy Spirit tell us barley loaves? Oh, that's the cheapest lunch <laughs> uh, that barley loaf was the cheapest bread, uh, not a very good one. He was, he was very poor. In fact, in the Jewish Talmud, the rabbis actually said barley is for animals, donkeys. You feed that kind of thing to an animal, you don't eat it. This boy is so poor that all he can afford for lunch is five barley, barley loaves, and some fish to make a sandwich, and two small, and here you use the, the, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit has John use the word osporia, not ichthus fish, but osporia. Um, it's a kind of fish that's really tiny, and all they have here is a little boy's very poor lunch. It's almost as if he had two little fish and five not so good bread. In Ezekiel 13, 19, you can read that the false prophets polluted God's name for the barley. <laughs> Just, they would go out of their way for some average reward, and they would pollute God's name for that too. That is an evil kind of a person who for the least reward of something would pollute God's name. So here's a little boy with a very poor lunch <laughs> and a very poor boy. And Andrew said, what are they? among so many. The men that sat down numbered 5,000. And Jesus told the disciples, make them sit down. What? Andrew just told him, we've got this little boy's very poor lunch. And Jesus said, go make them sit down. Would you have argued with the Lord at that point? How are you going to feed them with that one little lunch? Well, he knew what he was going to do, make them sit down. And I want you to understand that the moment they sat down, Jesus held up that lunch and asked God, here's what we have, thank you. He gave thanks. And now in his hand, he starts passing out to the 12, all of this bread and I assume some fish. And he tells them, you take this and you give it to the crowd. You be the waiters. Watch. He distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Hmm. There's a restaurant in Sykeston, Missouri called Lombard and here they actually throw rolls to you. 
and they keep bringing food as long as you ask for it, and they bring it around in buckets. And so they, you get as much as you would. Well, this, uh, the Lord's restaurant's like that too, isn't it? They got as much as they wanted. And I wonder what those 12 were thinking <laughs> as they passed out that bread. Where is this coming from? What's going on here? Well, 5,000 men sat down on the green grass. And every time I read that, I think of what the psalmist said, He, the Father, maketh me to lie down <laughs> in green pastures. God can take care of my needs no matter how little I have. A little poor boy's lunch and 5,000 men plus all of their wives and children are eating as much as they would. Make them sit. Did you notice the Lord wasn't in any hurry here? <laughs> he makes me to lie down in green pastures in His time, not mine. His will is connected to His timing, but His timing may not be my will. <laughs> And when they were filled, now watch, the Lord doesn't want us to waste. He deliberately brought the disciples into the work. And when everybody was filled, he said, go gather up what's left. Not crumbs on the ground, fragments of all of that good food he'd been feeding them. The little boy, that little boy had a far better lunch when the Lord was around than he would have had without him. And everybody there had a better lunch than they would have. They got as much as they wanted. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? The psalmist asked. Yes, Psalm 78, 19. I always wonder when I read this about these 12, should they not have known what he could do? how quickly God's people forget what He can do. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets, look at that, with the fragments of what? The five barley loaves, <laughs> which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Now, they had their bellies filled. After lunch, conversation. <laughs> and they still don't understand who he is. Watch. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus had said, this is of a truth, that prophet. Well, they knew something about their Bible anyway, because Moses in the long ago had written that of your own self shall God raise up a prophet like unto me, Deuteronomy 18, 15. And so they, they think maybe he's that prophet, but the Messiah they wanted. This guy is not a military king, but he may be a, one of God's prophets. And that's as far as they could get in their thinking. This is that prophet. Uh, Jesus knew their real thoughts. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he might be that prophet, but let's make him our Messiah if he can do that kind of thing. We want a king. That's physically speaking. We want somebody to go against the Roman Empire. Even just before he ascended into heaven, the disciples asked him, Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1.6 they still didn't have it. Herod Antipas was the king in Galilee at this time under Rome, but they wanted an earthly kingdom. That's the devil's temptation. He told the Lord, if you bow down to me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. They sat down at lunch ate all they wanted, and still said to, in their minds, 
Let's make him our king. Let us make him our king. Therefore, he can do our bidding. No, we don't talk to the Lord that way. They still did not understand, and he knows it. And that's where this sermon about him and taking part totally in him starts, with that thought that he knows they're nothing but worldly people. They got fed, they saw the miracle, and they want in on it. I actually heard a brother in Christ say, say with his own lips one day, well, after all, the only reason we're Christians is that we can go to heaven. The only reason we're Christians is to go to heaven. That's the statement the crowd is making. The only reason we follow him is there's something in it for me. There's a reward for me. Now, I know that a cup of water given in his name will not go without reward. I understand that. But if that's my thinking, that that's the only reason I follow him is for the reward, I'm like the crowd. I still don't understand that if I love him, I'll keep his commandments. They were focused on what he could do. They were not focused on Jesus. And he knew it. And so he goes back up on that mountain alone. He wants to get away from these people. He made them satisfied, but now he had to flee from them. Well, that evening, according to verse 16, his disciples went down into the sea. They, they were used to crossing the Sea of Galilee, some of them were fishermen, you remember four of them, Peter, Andrew, James, and John were all in the fishing business, so they would not have been fearful of taking a boat out on the Sea of Galilee at this time of the day. They entered into a boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was now, now dark, and Jesus isn't with them. He's gone up on that mountain alone. He's by himself. He could see from up there what was going on, I'm sure. It's already dark. Uh, they had been in a storm with him before, you remember. And they got fearful, but uh, he woke up and said, Peace be still, told the storm to stop, Matthew 8, 24. Well, this time, again, there's a huge storm. Galilee is a shallow sea, a shallow lake. It sits 600 feet below sea level in a cup-like depression. You have to go downhill everywhere to get it on the Sea of Galilee. And when the wind starts coming down, that shallow sea just boils. And they are headed into the wind in the direction they're going. So headed into the wind, they can't make much progress. Even rowing, of course, a sail would not help them at all. It would have blown them back. And so they're headed into the wind. There's a huge storm. And they rowed about 5 and 20 or 30, about 35 furlongs. And they can't get across the lake. He's up on the mountain. They're in the sea. Sound familiar? He's still up on the mountain of heaven, and we're still in the sea. And there's trouble down here. And as they look, what do they see? He's walking on that stormy water. Huge waves everywhere. He's walking across on it. It looks to me like, given the time it is now, that they had been rowing on that lake for about six hours, maybe even eight. They couldn't get across. The wind was so strong. And according to Mark 6.48, Jesus was watching them seeing what they would do. He's already tested them. They still don't have quite the right idea about him and who he is and why they should be following him, but he's watching. He's watching them in their trouble. And what does he do? He comes walking on the water. 
He's up on the mountain of heaven. We're down on the sea. There's trouble down here. We're trying to get through it. Here he comes. Does Jesus care? Oh, when I'm in the sea, he knows it. And you know what they thought? They thought he was a ghost. And they were afraid. <laughs> According to Mark 6, 49 and 50, they thought they saw a ghost, <laughs> an apparition. He intended, according to Mark, to pass by their boat so that they would understand that just a vision of him would be their safety. Just a catch a glimpse. And they didn't ask for super, supernatural help this time. They were just afraid. And what does he say to them? It is I. They're looking at him out there on the water. He said, here I am. So he intends to pass by. He's trying to teach them something about his power. They need to learn this. Another thing occurred to me. Where were those 12 baskets of bread they picked up? They had to have had it in the boat with them. So they were well supplied with food, but they were afraid of the storm. Uh, they couldn't have starved to death out there on that boat. But they were still shocked. Now get that, when they saw him on the sea. They don't get it yet. And so Jesus said, it's I, fellows. Those calming words were enough. And this time he says, Ago at me, it is I. The next time he says, Ago at me, I myself, I, I am, is going to be connected to other words. A divine designation. Ego and me. I myself am. Get that. And at Matthew 14, 28, we're told that somebody on the boat said to Jesus, who was intending to pass by, let me walk out there. And Peter got out of the boat. And Matthew tells us that he started to walk. He's got his eyes focused on Jesus, and Peter is walking on the water. And then Matthew says, all of a sudden he remembered how stormy it was. And he lost his focus on the Lord, and the Bible says something very unusual. It says he began to sink. Began to sink? Have you ever thrown a stone into the water? It doesn't begin to sink. And so here comes the water up to his ankles, his knees, his waist. And I love what Peter did finally. He just reached up and the Lord pulled him out of the water. Jesus brought them to their destination. Watch verse 21 and don't miss this. Watch what it says. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. They, they invited him into the ship, and the ship is immediately at Capernaum. What a miracle! What a fast boat! And the moment he stepped into the place where they were in trouble, they were immediately saved. Hard work At w this week, was it? Monday through Saturday, a lot of trouble happened. That's why Sunday is the day of rest. That's the day we go meet him. That's the day we invite him into the boat. And I feel sorry for those who miss that day of worship because they've got to go through that day with all the trouble they had all week. But that is disciples. They were at rest. The day following, now the next day, 
When the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one whereunto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. However, there came other boats from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they did eat bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not in there, neither his disciples, they took shipping and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they had found him on that other side of the sea, they said unto him, Master, how did you get here? Well, he didn't tell them he walked over the sea. <laughs> the crowd find, found him. Must have been a lot of boats from Tiberias or not that entire five or 6,000 people didn't come at this time. But a crowd found him. And verily I say unto you, you seek, he's not interested in answering their question here. He's interested in their souls. And he said, you didn't come over here to find me particularly. You came over here because of a physical idea. You saw the miracle, you were fed, you were filled, and you didn't really want me you wanted something for you. And he tells them straight out, don't work for the food which perishes. You work for that food. Now he's going to reference himself as food, keep that in mind, which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. At his baptism, God said, this is my beloved son. At the transfiguration, God said, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. God had already set his seal. He had guaranteed him as the Christ, and he had guaranteed him as the Christ of the world. And so don't work for the food that perishes. You came all the way around the sea or over the sea in those boats just to, because you want another miracle? Then they said unto him, now they got the, what he said all right. You have to work for the food that doesn't perish. But they said, what's the work of God? What do we do to work the work of God? God guaranteed me you have to work for the food that doesn't perish. And he said, here is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. The work of God is faith. Yes, faith is a work in and of itself. It's God's work, not ours. It's one thing God demands, not what we have to do out of our own thinking. It's not our work, it's His. Just as repentance is not our work, it's what He commanded. Just as confession of Christ before we are baptized is necessary. That's His work. Baptism is His work. And so salvation is not of works, ours. It's out of God's work. That's why Peter said, I perceive that in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted of him, Acts 10, 34 and 35. Now, he told him exactly what to do to trust him. And they said, what miracle can you show? that we may see and believe thee. What do you work? What? You sat down yesterday and were fed from a little boy's lunch, and you want another sign before you believe? <clears throat> yes, sir, we want a miracle bread from a miracle king. That's the crowd. We want something from you so that our lives are better. Give us something. Now comes the teaching that they will not like. This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And they quote there, of course, from Exodus 16, 15. 
Jesus said, Truly, truly, I send you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gave you the true bread from heaven. Moses fed you physically. I'm talking about your eating spiritually. For the bread of God is he, he's talking about himself, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now, Hey, that's something for us. So they said, give us this bread. Thinking physically still. They still haven't caught it on that he's talking about themselves. Lord, give us this bread. And now we have the first distinctive I am. Ego a me. Bread. I am the bread of life. Keep in mind about the fact that he's talking about himself as spiritual food. He that cometh to me shall never hunger spiritually. Although we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness, we'll never miss eternal life if we come to him in the right way that he appointed. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Notice bread and water. Those ideas together talk about the opportunity, and the opportunity to have eternal life is wound, bound up in the bread of life. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise throw out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Jesus explained to them now why it was they had rejected his true mission. This is the Father's will which has sent me, that all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. That's God's plan. You need to understand that. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then complained. Now we know some of this crowd. And incidentally, he's in a synagogue in Capernaum now where he's teaching. And we'll read that in just a moment. They complained. You said I am? Aren't you the son of Joseph and Mary? We know your father and mother. Uh, how is it then that he said I came down from heaven? And Jesus said, quit complaining. Quit complaining. You have to do something. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. That drawing is done through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ today. Here, it should have been the fact that he, the Father was drawing them through what Jesus was teaching them, but they didn't hear it. And I will raise him up at the last day. And how is that drawing done? As I said through the gospel, you have to be taught of God. Christianity is a taught religion. It's not a better than, felt than told religion. It's taught to you. Go teach all nations. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Evermore, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father comes to me. Because if you're studying God, you know that Jesus is the one he wants you to obey. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is from God, he has seen the Father. We've already talked about the fact that no man has ever seen the Father yet. Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. I'm the food that you should be eating. Now watch. He that believeth, believing is to trust and obey him. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. I am that bread of life. You ate, your fathers ate physical food in the wilderness. They died. But the bread which comes from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Eternal life is in the eating of this bread. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of the bread, he shall live forever. Total participation in the teaching of Christ that's eating the bread. 
This is no reference here to the Lord's Supper. There's, the only connection would be that the Lord's Supper is remembering the bread of life. But we're not eating His flesh and drinking His blood when we take the Lord's Supper. We're, we're here, though. He's talking about total participation in obeying Him. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. I'm going to give my body. You'll have, you will be required to remember that in worship. And so the Jews therefore strove among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They still were thinking physically. He's not talking about eating their, his fleshly body. In fact, it's the case that the early Christians were accused of being cannibals because as the Roman government put it, they ate their Lord. They, nobody seems to understand what he's saying here. Is about participating in him and what he teaches completely. Not some idea of chewing on his body. Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. How do I do that? I obey what he said when he walked out of that tomb in that body. And the only way to get into his body, the church of Christ, is through baptism. Acts 2.47 For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Total participation in the Christ is absolutely necessary to eternal life. The one whose flesh is deity said, you must feed on me. And the one who feeds on him believes what he taught and obeys him. Drop down to verse 63. And we'll come back to verse 56 in a moment. It is the spirit that makes alive. That's the Holy Spirit. The flesh profits nothing. You want to know how to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Watch. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You want to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ? You're going to have to obey his words. You're going to have to do what he told you. And the only way to contact that blood is stated clearly in the Bible. Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, keep, underline that word delivered, I delivered unto you that which I also received. Paul had something delivered to him, and he received it that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul said, I delivered you a message about the death, burial, and resurrection. I obeyed that message of the death, burial, and resurrection. How did you do that, Paul? Romans 6, 16 through 18. Know you not to whom you use yourselves servants to obey? His servants you are whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, you were the servants of sin. Watch now. But you have obeyed from the heart. They knew exactly what they were doing. That pattern of teaching delivered you. It was a taught message. And being then made when? When they obeyed from the heart, the pattern of teaching delivered. Being then made free from sin, they became the servants of righteousness. Well, how do you obey the pattern of teaching, the death, the burial, and the resurrection? Listen to Romans 6, 4. Do you not know that so many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into His death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life? They obeyed the death by being buried in water, and they were raised. So they had a death to self, a burial in water, and a resurrection to walk in newness of life, 
And God at that point took away all of their past sins because they had obeyed from the heart, the mind, a pattern of teaching. What was it? Death, burial, and resurrection. That's how you feed on the Christ. That's how you have total participation in His blood and in His flesh. And Jesus said, The living Father sent me so that he that he is me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread. He's talking about himself, which came down from heaven. And it takes total participation in him, a total immersion of the body into him in order to have eternal life. And he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now he's in the synagogue, and watch what happens when the crowd hears this. They said, this is a hard impossible for us to obey this. We can't believe that you're the only bread of life. Surely there are other avenues. I mean, everybody's trying to get to heaven. We're just going by different roads. Oh, no. And this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Jesus knew what they were saying. Maybe we can't hear their voices, but he knew their hearts. He said, you got a problem? Did this offend you? Do you know how many folks are offended by the fact that they have to be baptized for missionary of sins and their preacher told them they didn't? The preacher's just like this crowd. This is too hard a saying. We don't want to hear it. And those who don't obey him in baptism for remission of sins are just like this crowd. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Did this cause you to stumble? He doesn't back up. Well, no, you don't understand, Jesus. I mean, we, we know what Messiah is supposed to be. He's supposed to be this military king, isn't he? And you're telling us that you came on a spiritual mes mission? We don't want to hear that. They came across the Sea of Galilee for something for themselves. And they didn't get what they wanted. That is a great description of denominational Christianity, which is no Christianity at all. They get what they wanted. I actually had a denominational preacher tell me that his group were consumer-oriented. We give the people what they want. And anything else is too hard a saying. Did this offend you? Is there some kind of a scandal you're hearing? And then he says, what if you see the Son of Man up, send up where he was before? He knew he was going back to heaven. That's Acts 1, 10, 11, which actually happened. And his own, the 11, were standing there watching that with their mouths wide open, I suppose, gaping up into heaven. And they had already forgotten, in a way, what he had told them to do. He told them to go back to Jerusalem and wait there until the power of the Holy Spirit came. Luke 24, 47 through 49. Here they were standing there watching him go up into heaven. They saw it. This crowd didn't. Why? They didn't believe him. You think this is amazing, feeding the 5,000? Wait until you see me ascend into heaven. His miracles are overwhelming. He could walk on water, feed 5,000 with a boy's lunch. That's impossible, isn't it? You know, water has a kind of tensile strength. There's a meniscus. I was taught in chemistry class, you can't measure water level by the top of the, but the bottom of that little curve in it. It's all curved. And if I understood the tensile strength of water and how it works, I might be able to figure out scientifically how to walk on that stuff. But he knew it because he made it. And so out he walked across that water. What power? But the real power, the power that God used when he breathed into the 
dust, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2, 7. That breath of God is so powerful, it can give us life. And that breath of God is found in the Scriptures and nowhere else. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the chrema, the breath of God. That's why Paul said all Scripture is God's breath. 2 Timothy 3.16. There's such power in that. And to partake of Him fully, to eat of His flesh and drink of His blood, to be a total participator in Him requires that I obey His message. And that will give me that life He's talking about. Well, watch what happened. He said, there are some of you that believe not. He's standing in their synagogue, and he says, you don't believe. In fact, that you there is probably a reference to the twelve. He said, for he said, I know from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. He knew what Judas was like right from the beginning. <laughs> and yet he chose him. Our God is the God of the second chance. Unfortunately, Judas never took part in that second chance. He never took a second chance. From the beginning, he was a thief. He was the treasurer <laughs> for that group of 12 and Jesus. And yet, seeing all that he saw, he betrayed the Lord. What for? Money. Why did that crowd come across the sea? Something for themselves. Why did Judas betray the Lord? Something that was in it for him. And God knows this. And he said unto you, No man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Verse 65. God knew. God knew what His Word would do when He sent it here in His Son. He knew it. God knew that the Word of God was designed to draw or repel. The Word of God is a two-edged sword. It can draw you to God or it can repel you. And I want to say this as clearly as I can right here. Many of you listening to the gospel were told all you have to do is believe. That's not true. It never will be true. You must believe, repent, confess Christ as deity before witnesses. You must be immersed in water in order to the remission of your sins because it's at that point that God takes away your past sins. All of that must be done. That message that you just heard can draw you or repel you, but it will do something to your heart either way. It will either prick it so that you obey, or it will callous it and make you harder against it than you were before. That's up to you. Watch what this crowd did. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That whole crowd's gone now. They didn't get what they wanted. Well, I know what the Bible says, but it doesn't give me what I want. Then you won't obey it. Well, that's too hard a saying. You're making it too hard. I just want to believe and go about my business. I think I'll just go away, Keith. I, I, I don't like what he said there that I have to be baptized. I don't like it that I'm going to have to give up certain things. I mean, if I become a Christian, I can't go to the gambling joint anymore. I don't think I can give that up. If I become a Christian, I'll have to quit going to the bar. I don't know if I want to give That's too hard to say. You know, if I become a Christian, I can't be married to this woman with whom I'm now married legally because we're living in adultery. Both of us were married before and this is too hard a saying, Keith. We just, we're just going to go away. 
You know, if I obey the gospel, like you say it's written, no, not like I say it. Well, Keith, if I obey the gospel, that means my parents are lost. They didn't obey the gospel. It's too hard. I'm just going to go away. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And poignantly and sadly, he turned around. And he looked at the twelve. He's looking at me right now, asking me the same question. And he's asking you, will you also go away? Is Christianity too hard for you? Sometimes you have to give up your own physical family to be a Christian. Paul had to give up Judaism, power, political power, preeminence. And he said later, that's all a dung heap as far as I'm concerned, Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Wow. You have to give up something to be a Christian. You have to count the cost. You might have to give up your life. Is that too hard? Are you also going away? Total participation in the Christ. Eat his flesh, drink his blood. Too hard for them because they wanted the physical food. And it's too hard for many today. A multitude of people claiming to be Christians have come and gone in this world. They've come and gone in Catholicism. They've come and gone in Protestantism. They've come and gone in Judaism. They've come and gone in Islam. And they've gone away from the Christ. And we have to go to Him to have eternal life. And so the twelve are asked, are you going to go away? Peter answered, Lord, I like that, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. <laughs> Where could I go but to the Lord? And watch what Peter says. And we are, believe and are sure that thou art Messiah, deity, the Holy One of God. We believe it. Now Jesus tests them again. And it's interesting what he did here. He's testing the twelve again. Well, you believe I'm deity, but I chose all of you, and one of you is a devil. Am I still your deity? He spake of Jesus Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Next time, we'll start chapter 7 in this great account of the deity of Christ.